Hey friends, it's Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, on this week's episode, we are going to discuss the topic of the location of the real Mount Sinai. Now, specifically, this is a response to Dr. Michael Heiser. So I've had Dr. Heiser on the program a few times. Uh, we're friends. Um, I think I endorsed one of his most recent books. And he dedicated his last, one of his most recent programs, uh, the, his podcast is called The Naked Bible Podcast. So this is episode 260. And he dedicated much of the program, unfortunately, to arguing that Jebel al laws this mountain in Saudi Arabia, is not the real Mount Sinai. Now, this is probably a good time to announce that my book, Mount Sinai in Arabia, is now available. I actually haven't announced this really on the underground yet. So the book is now available. Um, as I've mentioned before, it was a book that I never really intended on writing. This was essentially the introductory material to another book that I'm still working on, and I know it's taking forever. It sort of just keeps taking longer than I planned on. But in any case, if you go to my store on joelstrumpet.com, what I've done is you can either just get a signed copy of the book, um, or if you are more of a visual learner, I also have bundled the DVD set or the flash drive set. These are both the same uh, classes, but it's nine classes. So it's not quite nine hours total, but it's probably about eight hours of teaching where um, I'm just here in the studio and I sit down and I work through the information in the book. And so um, in the DVDs, there's some more pictures and some extra videos. And of course, I ramble a little bit more than usual, but um, these are great if you're if you're working through the material, I mean, even just like in a small group, this is a really fun study. Um, it's amazing how excited people get and sort of how faith stirring it really is. What a, what a fun topic. Um, but again, I'm really excited. Um, this is actually the smallest book that I've written. It's, uh, it's not even 200 pages, but Mount Sinai in Arabia. Again, you can get it on Amazon, um, but if you go to my website, of course, it blesses the ministry more and you get a signed copy. Um, we also have, by the way, and this is really neat, we've minted a coin. And um, on one side of the coin is the Joel Richardson Ministries logo, and on the other side is the split rock of Moses. And just a, a short reference from 1 Corinthians where Paul actually says that the rock itself represents Jesus um, and that it followed them in the wilderness. And that's sort of an interesting topic, but we won't get into it. In any case, you can actually get a, one of the coins as well as the book. So we've got that there as a bundle on Joel's Trumpet um, on the store as well. So a lot of fun stuff, but let's go ahead and just um, jump into the topic. Now again, this is probably going to be a bit of a longer program than usual. I uh, really tried to trim down the information. Um, but again, Dr. Heiser on his podcast, I mean, he spends, I'm not sure, it's probably well over an hour discussing this. And I think he's said that he's going to come back to it and um, sort of try to debunk it uh, more here in some of his forthcoming programs. But he spent quite a bit of time on this topic, so I did want to respond. And the reason is um, because he really made a lot of significant errors. I mean, really significant errors in the program. Now, let me just say this before, before I jump in. The difficulty with these things is when someone criticizes um, you or something you know that you that you teach it's not usually the criticism that gets criticized but rather the response so I, I I'm, I'm in sort of an awkward position because on one hand um, as I said he made some really Dr. Heiser made some significant errors on the other hand um, you know I don't want this in any way to come across as a personal attack um, I just want a response to the substance of his arguments and so hopefully I can do this in a in a um, brotherly, Christ-like, and meek manner, um, while still emphasizing the fact that, as I said, some of his arguments were just really poor, uh, really sort of sloppy arguments. So um, with that said, I did email Dr. Heiser. I initially sort of challenged him, push him back, uh, to push back on some of the issues, and 
Uh, unfortunately, he just really wasn't receptive. Um, he really just sort of pushed back and said, you need to bend to the text. And I said, well, you know, there's other ways to read it other than your particular interpretation of the text. Um, but as I said, he wasn't really receptive. So then I invited him. I said, well, come on the program. You know, let's talk about it. We're friends. You know, I endorsed one of his most recent books. I've, I've encouraged a lot of my audience to, uh, you know, purchase his books. And again, um, as I've said in the past, a lot of his material on the divine council, on the supernatural, a lot of the stuff is just fantastic. I mean, if it were, he's been a, a tremendous gift to the body in terms of understanding a lot of these things. The, the ancient Near Eastern context of so many scriptures and passages that we wouldn't be aware of uh, if it wasn't for scholars like Dr. Heiser. So, again, I've, I've you know, so appreciated a lot of his stuff in the past. Um, but unfortunately, he was not willing to come on to the program. He was not willing to have me come on to his program. And so then I said, look, let's just be, let's be honest. Let's have a debate, you know, because this is the thing is, as I've said in the past, I've, I've invited Dr. James K. Hoffmeyer to have a debate about this topic. I've invited uh, David Roll. I've invited Gordon Franz. Now I've invited Dr. Heiser. And unfortunately, a lot of these, now Franz is not an academic, but role is sort of a, a renegade scholar, but Hoffmeyer is a legitimate scholar, Egyptologist. And a lot of these guys, they're, they're content to sort of like take pot shots and really in, in a real sort of uh, condescending way, you know, to use a lot of sort of bullying, scholarly bullying language, you know, um, refer to this idea that Jebel al is the real Mount Sinai. It's just absurd, sort of painted as this popular um, goofball sort of uh, idea. But when challenged to actually lay the cards on the table and defend their position in public, every single one of them backs down. They're not willing to do so. And if, if I can be honest, um, I don't have a lot of respect for that. Um, if you're, if you're going to be aggressive you know, and sort of mock something, then have the courage to come out and defend it. Um, in, a, in a situation like this, especially, look, and one of the things that Mike said, and I, and I want to be fair to him, is he just said, like, I don't believe in debates. He said, I think they can be uh, for people that are lazy because people don't want to read. And I go, okay, I understand that. And also they can be carnal. And, you know, I've said this in the past. It's, it's unfortunate when Christian debates can sort of be the, the Christian version of MMA. You know, hey, let's see my two favorite guys go head to head and see who wins. That's carnal. I think that's, it's stupid. Um, but I think by the same token, and, you know, again, this is what I, I wrote back to Mike. I said, look, when two reasonable brothers, and I, I think, I would like to think that I've demonstrated myself to be fairly reasonable, um, sit down and have a discussion. I, I, don't, this is, I don't even really like debates. I like the concept of public discussions. Um, when two reasonable brothers sit down and talk about something, it doesn't have to be carnal. In fact, when they demonstrate Christ's likeness, it really diffuses those, that, that, uh, percentage in the audience that is looking for a sort of the Christian intellectual MMA uh, thing that just appeals to ego and teams and that sort of thing. So, you know, I reject the idea that debates are worthless. I think they can be, but again, it depends on who is debating. So, in my opinion, it's really just sort of a cop out. Um, again, if you're willing to, you know, take an entire program to to dedicate to sort of um, deriding this particular view, then have a discussion. You know, again, I've just released a book. Mike's well aware of that. Um, the very reason that he's discussing it um, is likely because myself and a few others have really um, made this more of a, an issue. And by the way, it's about to become open to the world. I mean, this is a big, big issue. And, you know, I don't want to, for clarity, I don't want to in any way assume to know Mike's motives uh, in this. But, you know, if, and again, in fairness to Mike, um, in all likelihood, what it really is, is in the past, Mike has actually been a supporter of the Jebel Allah's theory. Um, and he's expressed some of this in emails to me personally. Is Now, over the years, there's been a lot of, um, I think he said uh, sensationalism. Um, I would just say there's been a lot of goofiness. You know, there's been a lot of popular goofiness that has accrued around this particular topic, around this discussion, around this mountain. And, you know, again, if I were to hazard to guess, why is he spending so much time on it? Because it's kind of funny, in his program, he repeatedly says, this doesn't matter at all. You know, the location of Mount Sinai is irrelevant. It has no value in terms of theology or eschatology or faith or any of these things. It really doesn't matter. But then he takes all this time to discuss why Jebel Allah is not the real, um, the real Mount Sinai. He doesn't 
get into the traditional site nearly as much. I mean, actually spends most of his time just talking about Jabal Allah's. Why does he have so much energy on it if it's irrelevant? And here's why. It's because Mike is a legitimate scholar. He's dedicated his life to biblical scholarship. And he's one of the few scholars who um, mixes with the laity, so to speak. So he, he uses the, um, the uh, Lord of the Rings sort of analogy, and he calls it Middle Earth. So this is sort of the, the part of the body of Christ that they're not just the Sunday churchgoers who just go to church, who, you know, are looking to find a good church that has good child care that can sort of serve them. But for those who are legitimate researchers that put in more study and this sort of thing, those who are a bit more diligent in studying the Bible and history and all of these things. So he wants to be someone who's not just a scholar, but someone who mixes with the people, who sort of makes his, his information more accessible and available to everyone. Okay, so... I appreciate that, but in that, he doesn't necessarily want to be associated with some of the ideas that he thinks are goofy. And so in his program, for instance, he mentions Ron Wyatt. And look, there's a lot of people that have different opinions about him, and you know, I've heard all sorts of things from the good to the, to the bad, and this sort of thing. And listen, I understand that. If you're a scholar, you don't want to be associated with that. So ultimately what I'm saying is it's, it's really about his, his image and sort of his reputation. Um, but, but here's the thing, and I want to be real clear about this. Most often, and I think anybody who's watched this program for any amount of time, you know, um, you know, I've got, I think I have three books that have been written specifically to debunk some of my previous works. Um, there's one book that's just called Debunking the Islamic Antichrist Theory. Um, there's another one called, um, I forget, um, I, for, I forget the title. There's a, there's a few that are almost largely completely dedicated literally just to debunking my work. I, I never really respond. I mean, I barely respond because, to be quite honest, I don't really care. I don't have any um, emotional need to defend my position or whatever. You know, it's, it's not like whoever has the best argument, God's going to go, oh, cool, I'm going to go, you know, with that guy. What will be will be. Um, time will vindicate the truth, and, you know, I could be wrong on all sorts of things. But with this issue, with this issue, you go, wait a minute, this is the location of Mount Sinai. Why is this important? With this issue, this is not just about some pet theory as to the location of Mount Sinai. This is not just an issue of, well, this is a potentially important archaeological site. I genuinely believe that God has a testimony. And I've said this, you know, on some of the programs, that God has a testimony with this mountain. Again, when you look at the biblical narrative, when you look at the story of the Exodus, and this is so important, the, 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 the word that just saturates all of these passages, the Lord's exhortation, his commandment to Israel is remember. Remember, remember, remember. Remember the mighty things that I did when I led you out of Egypt. Remember how with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm I delivered you, I saved you, I cared for you, how I fed you, how I gave you water, how I demonstrated myself. Remember all of the things that I did through the Exodus and at Sinai. The whole issue of the Passover is do all of these things so that you will remember. Remember, remember, remember. Now, you don't need to know the exact location of Mount Sinai to remember all of these things. We have the scriptures, we have the history. Okay, I understand that. However, I am convinced personally that the Lord has specifically preserved this mountain, this site, that, that he's allowed it to be sort of off the table, behind the, uh, the Iron Curtain, if you will, of Saudi Arabia for all these years and, and largely forgotten in the West until, and you have to give him credit, until Ron Wyatt went over there and started calling attention to it. Love him or hate him, he deserves credit for bringing this to the attention of the West. Now, again, I've highlighted this fact. Ron Wyatt did not discover it. The reason I say that is because it was never lost. When you go over there, the locals all refer to it as the Mountain of Moses. I mean, there's all sorts of archaeological sites in the area. It's well-known, well-established, long-established, and they believe that there, not because they're watching Ron Wyatt YouTube videos, not because they're reading some book by Joel Richardson or anything like that. It's because there is a very ancient Jewish, Christian, and then ultimately Islamic tradition that has been preserved in that part of the world. But this is a whole, whole different issue. The point is this. I truly believe this is an evangelistic issue. It's an issue of God's testimony. It's an issue of the gospel. You know, Mike makes sort of a, a whole deal at the end of the program. He just says, look, this has no theological, no eschatological importance whatsoever. Sort of who cares about it? But the thing of it is, is those are not the only issues. You know, I mean, that's to say, well, does it have evangelistic um, value? Does it have archaeological value? 
Well, yeah, it, it, of course, the location of Mount Sinai, it's not like, you know, well, I go to the first church of the location of the real Mount Sinai. I mean, it's not a theological issue. It's not an issue of faith. It's not a, it's, it's not a soteriological issue. It's not a salvific issue. But that doesn't mean that it has n there's no other issues in the world that are important. I mean, that's just, a, it's a very strange argument. Of course, it has nothing to do with salvation. It, has, it does actually have a lot to do with eschatology, um, but that's not to say that we have to know where it is. But here's the point, is that if God has preserved this place in such a profound way, which he has, I can tell you when I share the story, when I share the pictures, people walk away incredibly encouraged. It was one of the most faith-stirring, impactful experiences of my life. And again, to go there is to amplify this a hundredfold. I mean, when you see the videos, you go, wow, when you go there, it all just falls into place. And the fact that it has been so perfectly preserved and the fact that the Lord is about to open it up to the world, this is not an issue that should be dealt with so lightly. This is much bigger than Mike Heiser's reputation. This is much bigger than Joel Richardson. This is, a, this is about God's testimony. And ultimately, it's about the gospel. It's about the things that he did, and he's going to remind the world, because again, the world is forgotten. You look at the, the landscape of Exodus scholarship, I mean, half of these guys don't even believe the Exodus happened. You know, within just secular scholarship, they call it the Jewish myth. I mean, they don't believe it's happened, and yet all the evidence is sitting right there. And the arguments in favor of Jabal Allah's, again, Mike has not gone through them. You know, I've just spent the past year going through all of the scholarly literature, all of the peer-reviewed literature, all of these things. And the case is, is, you know, and I don't say it dogmatically, like, this is it, we know it, with some sort of, uh, you know, absolute certainty. You know, Descartes' imperative, this is, you know, but it, this, it clearly is the best candidate of any of the candidates, and it's a really good candidate. You know, so I don't claim to be a scholar. I want to be clear. You know, I'm not aware of too many things, but I know what I know, if you know what I mean. That's Edie Burkell. That just, that just happened. Um, but the point is this, is we have very reasonable, um, you know, we can look at these things and come to reasonable conclusions. It doesn't mean we know it with absolute certainty, but the point is this, is that the location actually is important. God has a testimony. Biblical archaeology is not irrelevant. If it's not your particular specialty, that's fine. But you don't just say, well, it doesn't have salvific uh, you know, application, therefore it's irrelevant. Or it doesn't have you know, eschatological implications, therefore who cares? People care about these things. I care about it, and I know that a lot of you listening care as well. Okay, so enough um, prelude. Let's go ahead and just jump right in. So the first error that Mike makes, and what I've done, by the way, is I've actually included um, clips from his program. So we're going to sort of listen to some of the sound bites so you can sort of hear it right from, uh, right from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So first of all, um, he misinterprets, and this is, this is key, he misinterprets a series of texts, specifically Deuteronomy 33. This is the blessing of Moses, Judges 5. This is the song of Deborah and Barak. And Habakkuk 3, this is the prayer of Habakkuk. So these three particular texts, Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, Habakkuk 3, he misinterprets these to be part of what he calls the Yahweh from the South tradition. Yahweh from the South tradition. What are we talking about? Well, essentially this view holds that there were various groups that were either descendants of or relatives of Abraham who worshipped Yahweh by that name, long before Yahweh revealed himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. So a lot of people, when they read Exodus 3, they'll say, well, this is where God says, look, I revealed myself as God Almighty to the forefathers, to those before you, but to you I'm revealing myself by this name, Yahweh. And so then the problem is that you have within archaeology, um, within some um, Egyptian texts and different things from some of these various Semitic peoples, that were working in the copper mines and some of the, the metal mines in the area, you have references to the name Yahweh or something close to it, Yahuwah, or something like this. So secular scholars, and this is important, secular, unbelieving, critical scholars. When I say critical, I mean those that look at the Bible critically, that sort of are looking for an opportunity to sort of deride uh, Scripture, deride the inspiration of Scripture. They sort of look at these particular texts and they go, gotcha. 
You see, the way they look at these is they say these are texts that speak of the origin of Yahweh. We're going to look at the texts um, as we move forward. We're not going to read them all right now. But essentially, like Deuteronomy 33, it says God came from Sinai, or God comes from Sinai. It uses the Hebrew perfect tense uh, of the verb, which most often is past tense, but it can also mean future tense. So God comes, or God came, or God will come from Sinai, and then it uses a series of other names, from Seir, from Paran, from Edom, and all of these sort of use these various toponyms, these place names, as parallelisms. Okay, so the Yahweh from the South tradition, again, this sort of view within, again, scholarship, um, holds that Yahweh, these traditions are saying that this is where God came from. This is where he originated from. Where did Yahweh come from? You know, he has this, this place of origin, and it's from the regions of Edom. It's from the area that is to the south and to the east of Canaan, to the, uh, on the Transjordan, okay? So this is modern-day southern Jordan. So this is a view within scholarship. Now, again, in fairness to Mike, in, in fairness to Dr. Heiser, what he's doing is he's trying to say, look, this may be valid, but that doesn't interfere with our high view of Scripture. It doesn't interfere with us as believers who believe that Scripture is inspired. And so that's sort of kind of what he's doing, but by the same token, he's using and sort of validating and, and accepting um, these particular texts as Yahweh from the South, as part of this Yahweh from the South tradition, in order to, to argue against Jabal al-Laws as the location of the real Mount Sinai. And there's just a handful of problems with this, and we're going to sort of dig into this. So the second problem, and I began to touch on this is his, within his argument, is that he argues that because these particular texts use parallelisms, so it uses Sinai, it uses Seir, it uses Edom, it uses Paran, it uses Teman, again, between these three particular texts, that all of these locations, all of these toponyms, must be all within a very narrow region. Now, I went through and I listened to his program because I pulled out the sound bites, and he says it a few times. He actually, um, he actually says that Teman is Sinai. Um, I'm sorry, he says that Mount Paran is Sinai. He, he says essentially they can be used interchangeably. And he says that all of these are essentially used interchangeably. Now, I emailed him and I said, so let me just mirror back to you to make sure that I don't misrepresent what you're saying. What you're saying is that all of these names are essentially the same. He says, no, that's not what I'm saying. But then I went back and I listened to his program, and that is what he said a few times. So he's really kind of waffling back and forth, and I think even probably trying to refine his particular position, you know, right now, sort of on the fly. But I think probably if pushed, what he would say is, no, they're not necessarily all the same mountain, um, but they're all within this very narrow region. Because they are parallel, because the scriptures use parallelisms, they're essentially interchangeable. Now... As a result of this, he says that Jabal al-Laws, okay, down in Saudi Arabia, he says that's too far south. That's simply too far removed from Edom, from Seir, from Timan, from these locations. It's down there in Saudi Arabia, and it's just not close enough. Therefore, it just doesn't work. So let's go ahead and listen to some audio clips from his podcast. Specifically, and we'll look at all these passages that are relevant. Yahweh is said in the Hebrew Bible in a number of places to have come to his land or come to his temple from the south. And the passages explicitly define the south with geographical terms like Haran, Timon, Seir, and Edom. Okay, so if you're thinking already, well, the south, that would be the Mount Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, the traditional site of Sinai. Or if you're thinking, oh, well, you know, Jebel El Laws, you know, in Midian, you know, I think that's Mount Sinai, and that's south of Canaan. So that's what that's what those passages are talking about. Sorry, they're not. These other places are a good bit to the north, again, of where people typically want Sinai to be, either the traditional location, way to way, way down the Sinai Peninsula, at the V of the two forks of the Red Sea, right in there. Or again, as as this idea comes and goes, but the idea that Sinai is in Saudi Arabia at Jebel al Laz, which is to the east, you know, about, I don't know, midway, maybe maybe a, a two-thirds of the way up, the fork, the right-hand fork of the Red Sea, the, the Gulf of Aqaba, 
Again, those other places are a good bit north, uh, or excuse me, they're, they're a good bit south to Edom, Timon, Paran, and Seir. So we have to figure out either a way to, to reconcile some of this stuff, or we've got contradictions. If you are going to try to reconcile holy mountain, you know, Sinai, Horeb stuff with Yahweh coming from the south, both of those locations are too far south of Timon, Paran, Seir, and Edom. They just are. It just doesn't work. Okay, so essentially what he's saying when he says those two locations, so for clarity, what he's actually saying is the traditional site of Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa, down there in the Sinai Peninsula, down there at the bottom of the pizza-shaped Sinai Peninsula that sits in between Egypt and the Arabian Peninsula. He says the traditional site, as well as Jebel al he says neither, neither of them work. Okay, so again, just for clarity, he's saying they're too far removed from Timan, Seir, Paran, Edom, and so forth. So therefore, they are discluded as possible candidates. Now, first of all, here's the, the sort of glaring problem um, with his argument is that, and I think this is actually fairly apparent to anyone who looks at, at these, these particular texts, Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, Habakkuk 3, they are not speaking of a static, singular, non-complex event. They're not saying, this is where Yahweh came from. They are specifically speaking of Yahweh as a victorious warrior. And what is he doing? He is marching from the south i.e., it is using Exodus language. Now, if you go through any number of Bible commentaries, they will, virtually all of them, will affirm this. It is referring to a procession. It's referring to a march. Marches, uh, inherently, by their very nature, begin in one location and move on to other locations. It's not just speaking of a singular, static event, or location, it's speaking of a march, a procession. The exodus began at Mount Sinai, and it moved north toward Jerusalem, toward the promised land, toward Canaan, so to speak. And that's exactly the language that these texts are using, okay? It alternately, alternately, it uses the language of Yahweh shining forth and radiating from Sinai, and the rays of his brilliance are shining up over the region of Edom, and they're shining up toward what? Toward the promised land. Now again, the nature of the sunrise, the nature of the dawn, is that it covers a broad area. So whether we're talking about a march, or whether we're talking about the sunrise, and by the way, this is going to become important as we move forward. Why does it use the language of the sunrise? Because the scriptures also frequently use that language for the return of Jesus. Look at Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. Darkness covers the people. Deep darkness covers the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you. It's speaking of the messianic age, and it frequently uses this language of the rising of the sun, of the dawn, for the return of Jesus. And that's the exact language that these passages are using. So again, the sort of um, the descriptions that are here, whether it be a march, whether it be the rising of the sun, these are things that cover broad areas. A parade begins in one location and it ends in another. And so anything on this parade location can be used as a parallelism. You know, if you are here in, I'm in Kansas City, if I was talking about the sunrise, I could say the sun rose from the eastern seaboard from Washington, D.C., it shone forth from the East Coast. You know, I could use any number of uh, various names, and they're all different, but yet they're all coming from that same general location. And that's exactly what these texts are doing. It's not saying Yahweh has to come from this very, very narrow little location, and this will become much more apparent as we move forward. Okay, so here is a statement from J.A. Thompson um, from the Tyndale Old Testament commentary on Deuteronomy 33. Just, I, I threw in some quotes from some different commentators, again, just because I want to highlight the fact that what I'm saying here with regard to these texts, because essentially what I'm saying, again, is that they are Exodus, it's using Exodus language, 
But in the ultimate sense, it's speaking of the greater exodus. It's speaking of the second exodus and the New Testament. The Jesus himself and the New Testament writers would have understood these texts. In fact, they did understand these texts to ultimately be referring to the return of Jesus. Okay, But the reason I want to quote again from some other scholars is just so that you know that this is not just some wacky Joel Richardson theory, that every element of the sort of logic within this argument is well affirmed you know, by many other commentators, scholars, academics. And so this is not just some unique idea, however, some unique idea to me. However, it's not really widely taught. And that's, that's why the subject of my next book, and this is, by the way, I'm really sort of giving away um, a lot of the, the punchline to my forthcoming book in this program. So if you're excited about my forthcoming book, then stick with me, um, because this is not all just arguments. I'm actually sort of talking about one of the main themes of my next book, which is this theme of the second exodus. I mean, this is a huge looming. You can't understand the story of redemption throughout the Old Testament, if you don't understand this, this motif, this concept of the second exodus, the greater exodus, because it's a very important Old Testament theme. And again, it's the theme upon which the return of Jesus is completely grounded in. It is the theme in which Jesus grounded his own uh, teaching concerning his return in, as well as the apostles, the inspired writers of the New Testament. So here's the statement from J.A. Thompson. He says, Yahweh, and again, he's talking about Deuteronomy 33. He says, Yahweh is depicted as coming from Sinai and rising like the sun upon Israel from Seir, shining forth from Mount Paran, approaching from Ribiboth Kadesh with a flaming fire at his right hand. Okay, it's a glorious, amazing, beautiful uh, passage. All of these really are. Um, but again, the picture is of Yahweh rising. It's not just some static, this is the origin. This is where Yahweh came from. Uh, as Heiser says on his program, that just, it, again, that's a view, I, I just have to affirm this, that's a view of critical, unbelieving scholars. It's not how Jesus and the apostles would have understood these texts. Okay, now, while these texts do use parallelisms, and I've already essentially said this, this is very easily accounted for by the simple fact that all of these locations were part of the Exodus route. They are all part of the Exodus event. And so therefore, whether we're talking about the rising of the sun or the exodus, all of these things fit, including Jebel Allah's, very neatly within the exodus event. And so that, that fact alone is sufficient to account for the parallelisms within the text. It doesn't, they don't all have to be synonyms for the same mountain or this very narrow location. It's talking about an event that unfolds over a broad region. Um, further, and this is really critical, they are all, all of these places are very, they are either within or very close to the biblical land of Edom. They are all very close to or within the parameters of the biblical land of Edom. And this leads to Heiser's second mistake. So Mike acknowledges that all of these places were in Edom. They were in the general region of Edom. Okay, he acknowledges that. The problem, and Mike includes a map um, in his podcast for everybody to look at. The problem is if, if you look at Mike's map, he completely botches the location of Edom. Now, the location, in fairness to Mike, that he has highlighted, you'll see it affirmed in a lot of Bible atlases. I mean, I've even uh, referred to Edom as this sort of location. It's sort of a common, um, you know, sort of place to locate Edom. But it's not nearly all of biblical Edom, and it's not accurate biblically. And this is really critical. So let's go ahead and look at the first verse just to sort of highlight what I'm talking about. So Ezekiel 25, verse 13. This is an oracle against Edom. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom, and I will cut off man and beast from it, and I will lay it waste from Teman even to Dedan. They will fall by the sword. So the Lord says, I'm going to judge Edom, and then he defines it. From Teman to Dedan, the inhabitants of Edom will be judged. They will fall, okay? Now, here is a statement from Lamar Eugene Cooper in his commentary on Ezekiel in the New American Commentary series. He says this, Ezekiel prophesied that the whole country, i.e. of Edom, would be laid waste. 
Timan was the extreme northern district of Edom, while Dedan was in the south. Thus, the mention of these two cities was a way of referring to the whole nation. Okay, so Timan defines the northern boundary of Edom. Dedan defines the southern boundary of Edom. Here's another statement in Jeremiah 49. Again, this is not just one proof text. Concerning Edom, thus saith the Lord of hosts, is there any longer any wisdom in Timan? Again, that's a synonym for Edom. Has good counsel been lost to the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? Flee away, turn back, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring the disaster of Esau. Again, Esau referring to Edom. And once more, it defines from Teman to Dedan. It defines the land of Edom as extending in the north from Teman all the way down to Dedan. Now, you go, Joel, why is that important? Well, as we will see, Dedan is hundreds of miles further south than Heiser defines the biblical Edom as. His map is just really uh, completely off. So here is a statement from the Lexham Bible Dictionary. Again, which is put out sort of in conjunction with uh, Logos Bible Software, for whom Heiser is the resident uh, scholar. So here's the statement for Dedan. It says it's a settlement in northwestern Arabia, known for being the center for trade and commerce. The reference to Dedan in Ezekiel 25, which we just looked at, suggests the site served as a convenient landmark to allude to the far southeastern extent of the territory of Edom, in contrast with the region of Timan, marking the northern extent of Edom's territory. So let's go ahead and look at a map, the land of Edom according to Scripture. Again, so here you can see Timan in the north, which is essentially pretty close to the Dead Sea. It's over there in Jordan on the Transjordan, which means to the eastern side of the Jordan, to the eastern side of the Dead Sea in modern-day Jordan, southern Jordan. But then Dedan, you look at Dedan, Dedan is way down there in Saudi Arabia. And I've got a, a dot there for Midian, which, by the way, is basically the location of Jebel al -Laz. And as you can see, Jebel al is essentially right in the heart of it. So if indeed this is biblical Edom, then what that means is that Dedan was sort of a little pocket territory that was essentially surrounded by Edom. It was really right in the heart of biblical Edom. And as you can see, it's interesting that from Timan to Dedan, you're essentially halfway down to Mecca. I mean, you're, you're extending way down into the Arabian Peninsula. Now let me go ahead and just shift to the map that Mike um, is using really as the basis for his whole argument. And he has a green circle here, you can see, and he says, that's Edom. Now, that's a fraction of the size of biblical Edom. And so essentially what Mike's saying, you can see there, Jebel al -Laz, he goes, that's too far outside of Edom to be included in Edom. He goes, that's part of Midian. That's just like too far south. Again, we, we already heard him kind of make those statements. Now, again, I've thrown up another map just so you can see sort of the biblical Edom versus Heiser's Edom. Um, the blue dot is Mike's Edom. The larger gray area is the biblical Edom. Okay, so first of all, this is just, this is a huge mistake. And again, you know, in emailing Mike, he was kind of like, like I said, I, it was unfortunate. Now, listen, I, I understand. I am not a scholar. I don't expect, I don't demand Mike to interact with me. However, again, we're friends. We communicate. Like I said, I endorsed one of his books. Um, you know, I, I I understand what it's like to get a lot of emails and people want to argue with you and this sort of thing. Um, but basically what he finally said was just like, he goes, write a, write a paper and have it peer reviewed and, and I'll look at it. Um, I'm not going to get a PhD just for the privilege of having Mike look at my paper. It should be good enough that the Bible clearly disproves one of his primary pillars of his entire argument. The Bible should be enough. It doesn't have to be peer reviewed and this sort of thing. I think that's fair. So again, in looking at this, um, this is, like I said, it's a huge pillar in sort of his entire argument. And just right from the get-go, it, it collapses. And that's, you know, again, according to, to Scripture. So now here's, here's a fascinating sort of aspect of this whole thing. Timan and Dedan were the northern and southern uh, 
cities, if you will, the northern city and the southern city of Edom. But they also went on to become the northern and southern most cities in the Nabataean Arab kingdom. So the Nabataeans were those that came after Edom. This is sort of around the whole first century period, but they were, you know, a few hundred years they dominated in this area. Now, in the north, Timan is loosely um, identified with modern-day Petra. And then in the south, Didan today is called, in, in Arabic, it's Al-Ula. Just outside of Al-Ula is a place called Maidin Salah. So Maidin Salah was, if we look at it, I'm going to actually show you some pictures. This was the southern city, again, of the Nabataeans. So the Nabataeans largely replaced the Edomites. But today we have this beautiful site of Petra in the north, and what they call Maidin Salah down in Saudi Arabia is the southern Petra. Now, most people don't know about it because it's in Saudi Arabia, so you can't go there as tourists. However, we will be able to go there very soon. And I'm going to show you some pictures. It's stunning. It's absolutely beautiful. It's not quite as dramatic as Petra, but it, it, it's awfully darn dramatic, and I really want to go there. So here, here are a few pictures of Petra. Again, um, when you come through that, that huge crack, I forget what it's called, and it's just stunning, carved into solid rock, and then the monastery, which is a several mile hike um, away, and that's just a magnificent, magnificent um, structure. But now here's Didan. And you can notice, you can see the similarity of architecture. I mean, clearly these were carved by the same people, um, same archaeological sort of, uh, same design, same. Um, and then this one, look at that. That's just magnificent. This sort of just mesa sitting there, and then they just carved this beautiful Nabataean um, uh, structure into it. Now, what's interesting is that when you go to the town of Al-Bad, we're going to, I'm sort of going on a bunny trail here. When you go to the town of Al-Bad, the locals, and this is what I believe is biblical Midian, the locals there call it Midian, but they also call it Muger al-Shu'aib. What does that mean? It means the caves of Jethro. So right in the center of Al-Bad are similar structures to what you see here in Maidin Salah as well as in Petra, Nabataean caves. Nabataean, um, they're actually, some of them are um, not mausoleums, but burial caves, if you will. And then some of them were burial caves. I think maybe they were lived in initially, but these would have been Midianite and Edomite caves originally that were then later probably assumed by the Nabataeans, and maybe they added some of their uh, these designs and these carvings and so forth. But it's interesting that you have all of these similar, um, very, very similar uh, caves or carvings or buildings, whether it be in Al-Bad, i.e. Midian, or in the South Might in Salah in Saudi Arabia, or up there in, uh, in Jordan. Okay, number three, um, sort of the third mistake, and this is, now we're sort of getting into the meat of the matter that Heiser makes, is that he cites, and he really only quotes, three particular texts. And again, he says these are part of these Yahweh from the South traditions. Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, and Habakkuk 3. Um, the problem is that he cites select texts while ignoring a handful of other very, very important texts, which clearly are all part of the same tradition. Now, it takes a little bit of time to really weed through all of these, because now we're dealing with about 10 fairly longer passages, and again, I want to try to get through this as quickly as possible, but let me just highlight these. The first one is Isaiah 63. A lot of people are familiar with Isaiah 63. It has, uh, Isaiah is essentially looking down toward Edom, let's say from the vantage point of Jerusalem. He's looking down, he says, who is this marching up from Edom, clothed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? So you have God Almighty, and he's marching up through Edom. Okay, so you have that same motif of this majestic one marching up through Edom. And he says, who is this? And he says, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. His robes are soaked in blood because he has been trampling his enemies like grapes. Now, we're going to come back to this. Um, and then ultimately he says, well, why? Why are you stomping your enemies like grapes? He says, because the day of vengeance was in my heart and the year of my redemption has come. Now, clearly messianic language clearly day of the Lord language, but here he is marching, just like the other passages, up through Edom, coming up toward Jerusalem, coming up toward Canaan, toward the Holy Land. I don't even like to use the word Canaan, but coming up through Edom. 
And so a very, very similar passage. Then you have Psalm 68. Psalm 68 is one of the most magnificent, amazing, beautiful passages in all of the Bible. Scholars go nuts over it because they go, this thing is clearly a whole bunch of different songs that have been edited together. And again, it really depends on what type of view of Scripture you have. Is this just something that's been edited together, or is it one singular inspired uh, psalm? Because look, this really does pertain to uh, one's view of Scripture. Do you believe in the unity of the Scriptures? Do you believe there is one cohesive, unified story of redemption that is unfolding from the beginning? Or is it something that just sort of fell into place and the Lord allowed it to fall into place in a sloppy way? But don't think that the biblical authors really were that familiar with each other. Don't think that they were all really on the same page to the degree that Christians often give them credit for and this sort of thing. And I do. You know, I allow for some of the findings of critical scholarship with, you know, glosses later. Maybe, uh, you know, an editor adds, you know, something here or there. But, but the unified story of Scripture is clear. And these guys understood and they were familiar. The prophets were thoroughly familiar with Moses and they interacted with it in a very nuanced and very knowledgeable way. And there's, a, there's an intertextuality to the exposition of Scripture that comes before the various biblical authors. The New Testament writers, um, they, they were incredibly well familiar with the Old Testament, and they often linked different passages together. And Psalm 68 is an amazing psalm that links various themes together. It clearly links these previous passages, again, Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, Habakkuk 3, of God marching. It actually uses the language in Psalm 68. It calls it the procession of God. The procession of my God specifically, and this is what's fantastic, uh, fantastic, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. So what all of these texts are collectively speaking of, and it actually refers to Sinai in Psalm 68, is it's a march, it's a procession, it's an exodus from Sinai to Zion from Sinai, from one old sacred cosmic mountain to the final cosmic mountain, to the ultimate cosmic mountain, to the eternal cosmic mountain of Jerusalem, of, of Zion. This is why my forthcoming book is called From Sinai to Zion, the untold story of the triumphant return of Jesus. The return of Jesus is thoroughly rooted in these particular texts. This story of the Exodus is the backdrop. It's the pattern that's used for the return of Jesus. The return of Jesus is a complex event that unfolds over a period of time, and it is the second Exodus. It's the greater Exodus. Jesus is the greater Moses. Okay, this will all become clear, again, as I piece it together. I don't want to I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Psalm 110. What does Psalm 110 talk about? Psalm 110 talks about the Messiah, who is the Lord, and what is he doing? Crushing his enemies. When? During the time of redemption. So he's crushing his enemies like grapes, just like uh, Isaiah 63, just like Revelation. He treads the winepress of the wrath of God Almighty. You see, how does the book of Revelation contextualize the return of Jesus? It's rooted in Isaiah 63 the one who is marching up through Edom with his robes soaked in blood. Whose blood is Jesus' robe soaked in when he returns in Isaiah, uh, I'm sorry, in Revelation 19? It's the blood of his enemies because he has been treading the winepress of the wrath of God Almighty. That whole motif, that whole picture is rooted in Isaiah 63, which is clearly part of these same traditions. These traditions are not Yahweh from the South traditions that say this is where Yahweh came from. They are part of the second Exodus traditions, and this is how the New Testament writers interpreted them. Then you have First Enoch. Now again, First Enoch is not scripture. We need to be very clear. However, this part of Enoch, First Enoch 1, 1 through 11, was quoted by Jude, and it made its way into the New Testament. And there's a whole big sort of field of scholarship there. Well, how did that work? You know, sort of what is, um, you know, was, was Jude quoting something that was an ancient oral tradition that was part of Enoch? And, you know, we won't get into that. But the point is this. Enoch clearly uses all of the same language of Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, Habakkuk 3, all of these. And he specifically says, God Almighty will come from heaven and he will tread and land on Mount Sinai. Now, I know a lot of people are going, well, wait a minute, Joel. It says that he lands on the Mount of Olives. 
in Zechariah 14. If you read it, what it actually says, it says, in that day. Like, in those days, his feet will be on the Mount of Olives, but it says this. It says there's going to be a great earthquake, and then they flee. So if it says that he lands on the mountain and there's an earthquake, why would they flee if their Savior had just arrived? But if you continue reading, what it actually says is after they flee, it says that then he will come with all of his holy ones with him. After they flee, sometime thereafter. So when he returns, there's a mighty earthquake, and then they flee, and then he comes with his holy ones as he's doing what? Saving them, delivering them, crushing their enemies like grapes, going up to Jerusalem to be enthroned on the throne of his father David, and that's when his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And if you read it in that way, all of a sudden you go, oh, actually that is what it, it says. It makes much more sense. So Enoch uses all of the language of the Lord coming, coming from Sinai. It, it's very, very reminiscent, in fact, of Deuteronomy 33, much of the language, and it, and it culminates with, behold, God comes with his holy ones. The same language that's there in Deuteronomy 33, that's there in Zechariah 14, and it's the language that Jesus uses to refer to his own second return, his second coming, his return. And then finally, Jude 14 and 15, again, which quotes Enoch. So here's the problem. Heiser selectively quotes a few of these texts, but ignores the other ones. If he did read all of these, it would be very clear that they are not Yahweh from the South traditions. They are second Exodus traditions. And again, I don't have time to really get into that in, in tremendous detail. In fact, for the sake of time, what I'm going to do is actually skip forward. I'm not going to read all of these texts in detail because that'll take another half hour, add it to the program. What I would do is ask you all to study these um, and to read through these particular texts. But what I'm going to do, we're going to read some of them. Um, what I'm going to do is look at some of them as they reflect some of the particular motifs, some of the particular ideas or concepts that emerge that are common within these particular texts, okay? So, and this establishes, when we look at these, these common motifs that are shared by multiple passages, these shared motifs establish their common uh, focus, okay? So first of all, they all, oh, not all of them, but several of them have the motif of the Lord coming with his holy ones. I already just touched on this. Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. 1 Enoch 1, verse 9. Zechariah 14, verse 5. Matthew 16, verse 27. 25, 31. 2 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul, chapter 1, verse 7, and then Jude 14. I'm actually going to read these because these are sort of shorter than reading all of the passages together. So first of all, Deuteronomy 33. The Lord came from Sinai. Again, it could be the Lord will come from Sinai. The, uh, the perfect tense. Uh, and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there's lightning or fire or lightning in his right hand. Okay. Now, by the way, uh, actually, I don't want to jump ahead of myself. But did God literally march before them in anthropomorphic form, in the form of a man? No, he didn't. But will he when Jesus returns? Yes, he will come back fully God, fully man. This is another significant argument for these being messianic. Uses the language of Exodus, which again is the pattern for the return of Jesus. The, the one who came down in cloud, in fire, in blazing fire, in the clouds, with a mighty earthquake, with the sound of a trumpet, all of these things with thunder is coming back in the clouds. With, in blazing fire at the sound of the trumpet and a mighty earthquake, and he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. And the entire picture of the return of Jesus in the New Testament is rooted in the imagery and the language and the descriptions and the pattern of the Exodus. This is undeniable. This is not just some crazy idea that I have. It permeates Scripture. Once you see it, it's everywhere. First Enoch 1, verse 4, and then verse 9. Here it is. The great Holy One will come forth from his dwelling in heaven, right? And the eternal God will tread from there upon Mount Sinai. So it says right here in First Enoch that he comes from heaven and he comes to Mount Sinai. He will appear with his army. He will appear with his mighty host from the heaven of heavens. Look, he comes with myriads of his holy ones. So you can see the similarities there. He's coming from where? From Sinai. He's coming up from the south with his holy ones. Then you have Zechariah 14. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle clearly 
in the context of the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus. Revelation uses this language, and it applies it to Jesus. Behold, he comes on the clouds. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Again, he's in anthropomorphic form. He's in the form of a man. Then the Lord my God will come and all of his holy ones with him. There again is the motif, the language of him coming with his angels, his holy ones. And Paul the Apostle, by the way, says that when Christ is revealed from heaven, we will be revealed. Those of us in our glorified, resurrected bodies will be revealed with him. This is where we get the word revelation, the revelation, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus. Matthew 16, verse 27, here's Jesus applying this motif to himself, to his own return. He says, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father, just like in the Exodus, the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will repay every man according to his deeds. This is why I believe this mountain is important. This is why I believe this testimony is important and why I don't believe it's irrelevant. That's the mountain where the, the, the foundation of all of this is rooted. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. The whole world is forgotten. You know, he says it again and again and again. Remember, remember, remember. Half of the Jewish world is forgotten. Half of the, you know, the Christian world has forgotten. And the Lord is about to say, remember this. It all happened. It's all true. It's not myth. It happened. And the same God that came down in the clouds and the fire is coming back on the clouds in blazing fire, and he will repay each man according to his deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. There has been a man that has been appointed to judge the living and the dead. This is the gospel. You look at the book of Acts. Look at the way Peter and Paul and Stephen, look at the way they proclaim the gospel. They proclaim this. They say, a day has been set where we will stand before the judge of the living and the dead, and we will give an account. Repent, therefore. Repent, therefore, and put your faith in Jesus, lest you be, lest you be cast into the lake of fire, essentially. But this is the gospel. And so this is, again, I believe that this, this mountain, it's not just an archaeological matter. It is part of the Lord's end-time testimony. It is part of the gospel that will be proclaimed. Again, uh, you know, just not to get off on a tangent, the Jesus movement was the single greatest revival that has happened in recent American history. You go to any church, you ask, raise your hand if you got saved during the Jesus movement. This was the greatest ingathering in recent American history. Who wants revival in the United States? You know, anybody who is a believer, this is what we're crying out for. And what were the primary driving factors that led to the Jesus movement? It was the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. It was not fantastic apologetics. Um, apologetics are good, don't get me wrong, but it was the real on the ground. It was ground reality. Israel was reestablished. In 1948, 1967, Israel becomes a state. They take Jerusalem in 67. People are looking at the scriptures for a few decades there, and they're going, my goodness, this book is true. And I believe, I genuinely believe with all my heart that the Lord is going to use this mountain in a similar way, that when it is opened up to the world, that when people see it, and I'm telling you, you know, there's a lot of critics, but they haven't gone there. They haven't seen it. When you actually go there, you see the layout of the land. You see, and you work through all of the, all of the, uh, the data. You work through the traditions. You work through the biblical data. And you go, this makes so much sense, absolute sense. If this is not the real Mount Sinai, then essentially God has set up an incredibly elaborate hoax. You know, you can go down each point and go, well... I'm going to sow some doubt regarding this point. I'm going to sow questions about this particular issue. I'm going to sow questions. But ultimately, by the time you're all said and done, you just go, wow, there's another coincidence, another coincidence, another coincidence, another coincidence. At a certain point, you're just functioning like an unbeliever. Skepticism is good. Caution is good. But sometimes you're just denying what becomes obvious. So listen, I'm convinced the Lord is going to use this mountain. I'm praying for revival. I'm believing for revival. And I believe that the Lord is going to use this mountain as part of what I believe will be an end-time revival in the Jewish world, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, in the Christian world, in the secular world, throughout the world. The Lord is going to use this, and he's going to remind the world about the mighty things that he did because he is warning everybody about who is coming back, the one that's coming back. Okay, again in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory all his angels with him. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. What's that talking about? 
That's the throne of his father David. This is what I mean by intertextuality. Here Jesus is combining the language of the Davidic covenant that the Lord promised to King David that was then affirmed by Gabriel to little Mary, right? You're going to be the son of the Most High. He will sit on the throne of his father David, Isaiah 9. I mean, the, the branch of the Lord. Behold my branch, the root of and, uh, and the shoot of Jesse, you know, all of this language of the son of David, again, Psalm 110, it's everywhere. Jesus was very familiar with all of these things, and he links them all together, and he applies it to his return. He's not just the greater Moses. He's the greater Joshua that will enter in. He's the greater Gideon. He's the greater Elijah. He's the greater David. He's all of these things. Second Thessalonians, again, this is Paul, and Jesus will return for what? To give relief to you who are afflicted. This is, this is beautiful. The gospel is the good news for who? For those that are poor, for those who are afflicted, for those that are waiting for relief to come. And to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with what? His mighty angels in flaming fire. There is the Exodus language, flaming fire, his mighty angels. Again, it's rooted right back there in Deuteronomy 33 and all of these others. Again, Jude 14, 15, citing Enoch. It was about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all. Okay, so here is a quote from Thomas Schreiner. Um, this is in First and Second Peter as well as Jude in, again, the New American Commentary. Schreiner says this. He says, Jude spoke here of the second coming of Christ. Okay, so if Jude was speaking of the second coming of Christ, then that means that the early believers would have understood Enoch to have been speaking of the second coming of Christ, which means they would have believed, believed that Jesus came back from heaven and landed where? On Sinai. They would have clearly understood all of these traditions as referring to the return of Jesus. The holy ones with him... He will come with are his angels. And again, Paul tells us we'll be with him as well. The coming of Christ is patterned after God's theophany on Sinai. When he came with myriads of his holy ones, that angels will accompany Jesus at his coming is clearly taught in the New Testament as well. Again, the New Testament writers understood the theophany, the exodus, to be the pattern for the return of Jesus. What other motifs are common to these texts? Well, the motif of the Lord marching or through the wilderness, either through the wilderness, i.e. the desert, or Edom specifically. So again, you find that motif in Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, Psalm 68, Habakkuk 3, Isaiah 63, and you could probably find it um, else, you know, in some of the other passages as well. But again, there's that same theme of the march, the procession of God. This is a quote from Eugene Merrill. Um, in his commentary on Deuteronomy, and again, he's talking here about Deuteronomy 33. This is, again, in the New American Commentary. Um, Merrill is a, a highly respected uh, scholar, by the way, and he says this. He says, as most scholars have noted, the imagery here is of the divine warrior marching at the head of his armies on behalf of those whom he had chosen. The same motif appears elsewhere, especially in the Song of the Sea following the Exodus. That's Exodus 15, the Song of Deborah, that's Judges 5, and the prayer of Habakkuk. Okay, so here Merrill highlights the fact that this is not Joel Richardson's strange pet theory, that Yahweh is portrayed in Deuteronomy 33 as a divine warrior, and what is he doing? Marching, marching through the desert, following the Exodus route, okay? Um, contra... Heiser, uh, as opposed to what Heiser argues, Merrill states this, and this is concerning Heiser's argument that the parallelisms demand that they are all in a very narrow area. He says, the stylized or formulaic nature of such historical resumes allows them to depart from normal patterns of narration in which strict adherence to chronological and geographical sequence is expected. So he's talking about when they say God came from Sinai, the Holy One from Mount Paran, you know, all of these things. He goes, don't try to interpret these in too strict of a narrow way, which is exactly what Heiser's doing, saying, therefore it rules out Jebel Allah's. Eugene says um, that because of the stylized or formulaic nature, these are a little bit different than just sort of standard parallelisms. And so what other motifs? Well, you have the motif of the crushing one, and this is huge because this thoroughly roots these texts within 
the messianic context of which, the, of which they're part. So first of all, what do I mean the crushing one? The, the proto-evangelium, the first gospel, this is what scholars call it, Genesis 3.15, okay, Adam and Eve just fell. The Lord looks at the serpent, and he prophesies about the Messiah for the first time. And it's just in seed form, literally, in a very small, small sort of introductory hint. He says to the serpent, he says, listen, you're going to strike, you're going to bruise his heel. He is going to crush your head. And so already from the very beginning, the, the third chapter of Genesis, you have the Lord declaring that a wounded warrior would come. A warrior would come, he would be wounded, but in the end he would be victorious over Satan and he would crush Satan's skull. And then this theme, this motif, again, this symbol, becomes the foundation for so many other messianic prophecies. You get into Numbers 24, Balaam prophesies. He says, I see him, but not now. A scepter rises up out of Israel. He's talking about a ruler coming from Israel. What, is, what will he do? He will crush the foreheads of Moab. He is the skull-crushing one. He will, um, he will uh, defeat all of the, the inhabitants of Edom and Seir and this sort of thing. So that theme, again, is picked up again in Psalm 110. Um, Psalm 68, it says that you will crush the hoary heads of your enemies. You know, Psalm 68, the procession of God, he's, talked, he's talking about crushing his enemies. Just like in Isaiah 63, he's stomping them like grapes. Again, Revelation 19, Psalm 110 says that he will crush kings on the day of his wrath. This is a very, very common theme, a common motif throughout the Messianic prophecies, and it links all of these texts together. Um, again, the motif of the one soaked in blood, specifically on the day of the Lord's vengeance. That roots it in the context of the day of the Lord, in the future day of the Lord. The enthronement of God in Jerusalem. Now, that's again in Psalm 2. We're all familiar with that. Why do the nations rage? You know, behold, I have set my king on my holy hill. But it's also in Psalm 68. I've seen the procession of my God, my king, to the sanctuary. Matthew 19 and 25, it says that he will come forth from heaven, and then what? Sit on his throne of glory. And all of these have what? Him coming with his holy ones. Again, they're all linked. All of these motifs link these all together. And then finally, and I mentioned this previously, they portray Yahweh in anthropomorphic form. Okay, now sometimes you could just say, well, these are just poetic dramatizations. You know, Scripture is just sort of using flamboyant, poetic language. God didn't literally march. It doesn't really mean that. Yeah, you could do that, or you could say, no, it's actually literal. These are talking about Jesus. And I choose to do that. Why? Because that's how Jesus interpreted them. That's how the apostles interpreted these texts. What is the, uh, the fourth problem with Heiser's argument? Um, Heiser's view that Sinai, Edom, Seir, Paran, all must be close, very close. It clearly contradicts other scriptures. And, you know, I asked him about this when we were emailing back and forth, and he just sort of glossed over it. He glossed over it on his show um, because he referenced Deuteronomy 1, verse 2, which says this, It is 11 days' journey from Horeb. Now, we're assuming that Horeb is not necessarily Sinai, but that Sinai was part of the Horeb range, or it was very close to, to Horeb, that Sinai was close to Horeb, enough so that Horeb is called the mountain of God. And I believe, by the way, that Jebel Allah's which Jebel al is, by the way, is referring to the range. Um, when we were there, we asked the locals that live right there at the base, and he was saying, no, Jebel al refers to all of these mountain peaks, but this specific peak is called uh, Jebel Musa, the mountain of Moses. Again, they believe that not because they've been watching Ron Wyatt videos. Um, but the point is this, that that was the term in ancient times. It was Horeb, of which Sinai was one mountain. But so it says, it is 11 days' journey from Horeb, i.e., this little mountain range of which Sinai is part, by the way of Mount Seir. So if you're taking the way, this particular road, on your way to Kadesh Barnea. Now, Kadesh Barnea would have been up there in Edom. It's an 11-day journey from Sinai up to Edom. Now, Heiser's saying, no, they all have to be close. In fact, they're so close that Jebel al is too far that you can't consider it a candidate. And I go, but the scriptures say it's an 11-day journey. Now, he basically, what he says on his program is he says, we can't conclude anything. All it says is it's an 11-day journey, but we can't conclude anything regarding distance. 
So basically what he's saying is it took them 11 days to get to the same place that was all within a very, very... In other words, they didn't go anywhere. It took them 11 days. That's what it's saying. No, it's specifically making a statement. Why does it say that it is an 11-day journey? This is a, an idiom that is trying to give you a feel for how far away it is. It's a statement of distance specifically. That's the whole purpose of, of saying it's an 11-day journey. If you said it's a day's journey... In the ancient times, you know, you didn't say, well, it's five kilometers or it's 20 kilometers or this sort of thing. You say it's a day's journey and they would go, OK, so, you know, in modern times, let's say that's somewhere from 10 to 20 miles, depending on what you're carrying and who you're with or who you are or how old you are and all this sort of thing. Right. So when it says 11 days journey, it's a statement of distance. It's not just some irrelevant thing that you can gloss over because it doesn't fit with your previous um, argument. Uh, so this indicates, look, 11 day journey. You can argue about how far that was, but it does indicate a substantial distance between Mount Sinai and Edom. There was a distance. It specifically says an 11-day journey. But that's not the only um, geographic problem. And, and I said this again to Mike in the email. I go, look, in order for your argument to work, you have to be able to prove that Mount Paran, that Mount Seir, that Edom, that Basra that Sinai, all of these are really, really close. And the problem is, we may not know exactly where all of them are, but we do because there's a lot of biblical uh, data. There's a lot of passages that refer to these things, and they give us clues. And we can conclude with some reasonable sense of confidence um, where they are. Okay, so for instance, Midian was the farthest south. Okay, we know that. Um, and then from Midian, you came to Sinai. Then you were in the desert of Sinai. Then you came to the desert of Paran. So as you're coming up from Midian, you come through the desert of Sinai, the, the Sinai wilderness, and then you come to the wilderness of Paran, of which Mount Paran was probably a prominent, if not the tallest mountain within that. Now, here's what we run into, and this is where this whole thing becomes muddy, is that so many Bible atlases locate names like Paran and Sierra and all of these things based on the traditional view of Mount Sinai. So because they begin with the assumption that the real Mount Sinai is down there in the Sinai Peninsula, everything gets thrown off. But if you do away with that easily disprovable view concerning the traditional site, then the best, most logical, um, I mean, in terms of working through all the biblical data, Paran, by the way, is where Ishmael went when he was when he left Abraham's family and so forth, that this would have been the desert. If you look at a map at the Dead Sea, there's really this ridge of mountains that runs from the Dead Sea down just to the, just to the east of Elat, and then it sort of runs down the coast there. And then just to the east of these mountains would have been the desert of Paran. So right there in southern Jordan, just to the northern border of Saudi Arabia, and today this is Wadi Rum, it's a beautiful, beautiful place there in southern Jordan, that that is the best candidate for the desert of Paran. Okay, now, do we know that for sure? No, again, we don't know that with absolute confidence. But here's what we do know, is that moving further north, you would have had really the capitals of Edom. You would have had Basra and Timan, Seir, a lot of these prominent names associated with Edom. You go a bit further, you have Moab. You go a bit further north. Now, you're getting up into um, north of the Dead Sea. You have Amman. Um, or Ammon, uh, better pronounced. Okay, so we, we do have a loose understanding of where these places were located again. Um, but what Heiser is trying to do is move them all together in a very close place, whether it be Midian, whether it be Paran, Seir, Edom, Basra, all of these things have to be in this very, very tight little narrow area. Now, from Basra, okay, let's look at a map. From Basra, which today is, is called Busira um, in Jordan, um, and you could just say Edom, um, to the desert of Paran, again, which is most likely down there in Wadi Rum, it's about 80 or 90 miles away. Okay, now again, do we know this with absolute confidence? No, we don't, but we know these things with a reasonable sense of confidence. And there are some places that we do know that we'll sort of jump into. But here's the thing, is if Paran is 80 or 90 miles away from Edom, from Basra, then how can you say that Jabal Allah's, which is also 80 or 90 miles away from Paran, is too far away? You can't say that two out of the three or four parallel, the, the toponyms within this parallelism, that they can be 80 or 90 miles apart, but Jabal Allah's can't. That's inconsistent. 
That's a fundamentally inconsistent argument. And we have a very solid, reasonable understanding or expectation that Paran is much closer to Elat, whereas Edom or Basra in the north, which would have been or Timon, would have been up much closer to the Dead Sea. Okay, so again, 80 or 90 miles apart. You can demonstrate that some of these places have some distance. And this is what I said to Mike. I said, you're painting yourself in a corner. You're painting yourself in a corner. You're going to have to contradict other geographical data in the scriptures. Or you can just ignore it. That's another way to go. Um, but you're not going to be able to interact with that material and defend your position. Okay, so number five, the next problem is that Heiser repeatedly emphasizes that Mount Sinai must be west of Midian. Okay, why does he do that? Well, because in Exodus 3, verse 1, it says this, Now Moses was pasturing the flock, this is the NASB, uh, he was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So this is the first verse that Mike is dealing with. Now let me go ahead and just play an audio clip from his program. The text is clear that he leads the flocks, quote, to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. He has to go, so he has to, ta has to make a journey and to get to the mountain of God. That's what it says. It doesn't say that he was already at the mountain of God, like the Ten Commandments movie have, uh, has it. Like it doesn't... It, it, the verse doesn't suggest that Moses had to lead the flocks of Jethro a few hundred yards. No, it, 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 I think it, it's much more coherent to say Moses had to, had to take him somewhere else. And that somewhere else, to the west of Midian, is where we find this mountain of God. That's where Moses' encounter with Yahweh occurs. But the fact that he has to leave, and he winds up going west, well, Again, we, we know he's not at Jebel el Laws because if he went west, he'd run into the Gulf of Aqaba, the ocean. Okay, it's not it's not a wilderness where you're gonna you know have herds. Okay, so that that's an absurdity. So he he he's gonna have to go beyond the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba somewhere. He's gonna have to go north and northwest. You know, the, the west would be you got to clear the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, the right prong of the Red Sea, and now you're in, you're, you can find some area where you, know, you can take your flocks, okay? So that much we know. Well, if you go far enough north, you're in Paran, Timon, Seir, Edom area. I mean, there, there's a place where Midian blurs into Edomite territory to the north. Okay, so essentially... Uh, there's a few things there. Um, he first of all says that if you hold to the Jebel Allah's theory, you have to argue that Mount Sinai is in Midian. And that's not true at all. Um, the truth is, again, my belief is that Al Bad, the modern day town of Al Bad, the oasis town, is Midian. That's how it was understood in the first century. We won't get into that yet. And Mount Sinai is about 20 miles or so. I mean, it's a huge area. You could say it's 25 miles, depending on which side of the mountain we're talking about. But it's about 20 miles away. And the idea is that Moses left Midian, and he went to the other side of the desert, and he came to Mount Sinai. And it's on the edge of, it could be within the territory of Midian, but the idea is, yeah, it's outside of Midian. I mean, the idea that it's a couple hundred yards, I, he's picking on the Ten Commandments movie. I, um, that's kind of a straw man. But so first of all, his claim that the Jabal Allah's people have to believe this, that's not true. I've, I've never heard anybody say that. And he kind of does that. He, he misrepresents the position quite a few times, but it's just, it's a false claim. Um, second of all, he argues that Sinai must have been west of Midian, and anything else, he says, is an absurdity. Okay, that's also false, and here's why. Because the verse doesn't necessarily mean west at all. In fact, most translations translate it differently. So here's a a quote from the New American Standard Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek dictionaries. The word there is achar, and it is used here for the hind or the following part, once, after, 369 times, afterwards, 56 times. You can go through the list here. You get all the way down to the bottom of the list of all of the possible usages, and you have west, it's used twice, or the west side, once. So here's a word that's used I mean, I'm just guessing, looking at this, probably 400 plus times. 
and it's only used for West three out of those times where most often it's used quite differently. Here's just a little breakdown of how most translations translate the, uh, the verse. The King James has the backside of the desert. The New King James has the back of the desert. The NIV, the far side of the desert. The NET, the far side of the desert. The Young's Living Translation, behind the wilderness. The CSB, far side. ASV, back side. Uh, DBY, behind the wilderness. WEB, the back side of the wilderness. HNV, the back side of the wilderness. Um, essentially what I did is I pulled off the top 13 Bible translations off of Blue Letter Bible, which is kind of the easiest way to pull various translations. And of those 13, um, the NASB, ESV, and the RSV, those three use West, whereas 10 out of 13 use far side, back side, the other side. Okay, so the idea, again, if you get into this, is that this was is kind of an idiom. When it says West, it's referring to the way the sun sets and this sort of thing. All it's saying is, he went an extra far distance. You know, he went further than he usually does. He went to the far side of the desert. But here's the thing. Heiser relies on a select and less used translation to try to cast, um, you know, to, to, to make fun of and pick on in absurdity um, the Jebel Allah's theory because he goes, because it had to be west. And so it couldn't have been the Gulf of Aqaba. That's an absurdity. But then what does he do? He says that Moses went north. In other words, he goes... He goes, if he's at Midian, he couldn't have gone west, because, and he had to have gone west, but then he contradicts his own argument, and he says that he went north, past the Gulf of Aqaba, past Elat, up into Paran, and then he kind of says west or northwest, but the problem is, is that if you look at his map, he's not going, he's not going northwest, he's going west. I'm, I'm sorry, he's not going northwest, he's going north. Okay, so that, that, he's just contradicting his own argument there, and he's relying on a bad translation. So it's just a poor, it's just a poor argument. Okay, his sixth problem um, is, and we're just about done here, so bear with me. In order to make his theory work, Heiser actually has to move Midian itself right up there, basically into Jordan, or right on the border of Jordan. He has to squeeze everything together, and this is where, again, he starts with a false premise, and he just ends up doing damage to, uh, like, uh, compounding error in terms of biblical geography. So now he has to actually argue this, and this is, again, what I said to him. I said, you're painting yourself in a corner, and you don't realize that you have too much other biblical data, historical data, archaeological data, that is going to fly in the face of this idea that these places were all in this very narrow little zone. It just doesn't work. So here's a quote. Again, of Heiser saying that Midian had to have been much further north, again, right up there by Paran, by Elat, by modern-day Jordan. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. So now this brings Midian into the picture, also with Timon and Paran. And there's only one way you can do that, again, to have, to have this, whatever's happening here, and whatever peak this is, that it's in some area that it could be perceived as Midian and Seir, and, and we're going to get Edom. And the passage, Habakkuk 3, associates Mount Paran, which Deuteronomy 33, 1 and 2, linked to Sinai and Seir. It links Paran to Midian. So Timon, Paran, and Seir, and Midian are somehow interrelated. Now, this is possible, again, if by Midian we mean that northernmost, northwesternmost parameters, where it borders Edom to the north and southern Canaan to the west. Moses leaves Midian proper, which is east, and again, we don't know where he is, possibly even already north of the Gulf of Aqaba. Okay, so here essentially what he's saying is he's saying when Moses left Midian, he may have already been north of Elat, north of the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba. He was already up there basically by Jordan. So again, and he goes, this is the only way that you can do it. In order for his interpretation... Um, his, uh, in, in my opinion, his misinterpretation of the text, he has to group all of these things very close together. Now, where is Midian? Where is Midian? Well, again, scholarly consensus places Midian on the eastern side of the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, again, that could be up closer to Elat, or it could be further south. Now, throughout this whole region, and this is important, and this is what I mean about guys who, you know, they like to criticize it, um, but they haven't been there. They haven't seen the topography. They haven't seen the layout of the land. Because if you actually go there, or even if you just study it with Google Maps, you know, with Google Earth, 
then something becomes very apparent. From Elat, in terms of this whole northern area of Tobuk, you've got about 100 miles of complete mountainous dry desert. There's no place for people to live. So Heiser's got Midian up there just somewhere pushing toward the boundaries of what he says is the northern boundaries of Midian. And I, you really, he can't establish that with any biblical evidence, by the way. That's just sort of, um, he's just sort of throwing that out there um, to make his theory fit. But he's saying, you know, this is where Moses was. But I go, where would they have settled? It's dry. There's no, there's no springs. It's just mountains. It's desert. It's harsh desert. However, when you get down to the town of Albad, you have two towns right there. One is called Albad. The other one right is about 20 miles away on the coast is called Magna. They're both oasis, oasises, oases, oasises. There, there are two oases, oasises. I don't know how you say it. Two oasises. I'm just going to do it that way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go east coast. Use guys at your oasises, Okay. The, the town of Al-Bad was on the ancient Arab caravan route. Okay, so here's the point. If ancient peoples were going to settle in this area, there is only one real candidate. Or there's really, you could say two, Magna or Al-Bad. Magna, however, was 20 miles off of the Arab caravan route, whereas Al-Bad was on the Arab caravan route. Okay, so you have an oasis. You have a place with water, with springs. It's on this major caravan route. All of the the incense and all of the different things that would have come up from southern Arabia on the way to Syria, on the way over to Egypt, they would have gone right through Al-Bad. Okay? So that's important because there's really only one major place that was, that was hospitable. That, that was, you know, you can just throw something out arbitrarily and say, well, Moses might have been up here. But you go, that doesn't work in terms of just the geography. Like, from an archaeological perspective, that doesn't make any sense. But if you've been there and you see it and you go, oh, yeah, this is where people would have settled. And in fact, that's where people have did settle. And that's where all the archaeology is. That's where they find, by the way, what they call Midianite pottery. It's all sort of throughout the Tabuk province, but it's there in the Albad area. So um, what else is there in Albad? Well, there's an archaeological park that the Saudi archaeological you know, uh, authorities have set up. And it's called, again, I referenced this earlier, Muger al-Shu'aib, the Caves of Jethro. So the locals refer to this place as Jethro's house. This is where Jethro lived. Again, Shu'aib is the Quranic name for Jethro. There's also an archaeological area that's fenced off. And what is that called? It's called the Well of Moses. It's a very ancient well. Arab geographers throughout history refer to it. It used to be a, a usable well. And what does the Bible talk about? It talks about a place where people lived, i.e. Jethro and his daughters. There was a well where Moses encounters Zipporah. Okay, all of the features are there. Everything is there. Um, it's also, you know, beyond just sort of what the locals believe, what these ancient traditions have led them to believe, that this is a place where Moses and Jethro lived. It's also the place where the Roman geographer in the first century, his name was Claudius Ptolemy, in his geography, where he placed Midian. He called it Madiam or Marin, or Modiama or Mariama. Okay, there were variations. He actually has two towns that are sort of right there um, that would correlate today to Al Bad. Again, there was this very clear tradition in the first century that that was Midian. Now, in my book, I talk about the fact that the Septuagint also translates and understands Midian to have been a town or a city. When Jethro goes out of the land of Midian, it says he goes out. The idea is that he went out of the city, out of the town, out into the desert to go see Moses. When it uses the, the name the elders of Midian, it uses a very specific Greek phrase, which means the city councilors. Okay, and so then again, when you combine some of the information in terms of how the translators of the Septuagint understood Midian as a city, when you see that Claudius Ptolemy understood Midian as a city, that correlates today to Al-Bad. When you understand that the, that, the, that the locals today all believe that these ancient traditions um, lead them to believe that it is today the, the ancient homeland of Midian. And when you see that both Josephus and Philo both place Midian over there on the east coast, opposite Nueva, as Josephus clearly describes it, then you can't you know, conclude that this is absolutely it, but... 
we have a very reasonable suspicion to say that this is where Midian was located. Now, what do the scriptures say? Well, the scriptures don't link Midian with Edom up there by Elat. Rather, the scriptures link Midian with the Arabian Peninsula, with the Arabs that settled in that northern, really north-central part of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so here in Isaiah 60, this is in the context of the Messianic age, and it's talking about all of these peoples coming up. This is a beautiful passage from Saudi Arabia. And they're bringing gifts, where? To, to build the house of God. But here's what it says. It says, a multitude of camels will cover you. What? The land of Israel. The young camels of Midian and Ephah and all those from Sheba will come. They'll bring gold and frankincense. These are the things that come out of Arabia. They will bear the good news of the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered. The rams of Nebaioth will minister to you. These are the names of the other children, Kedar, the other children of Abraham, Nebaioth, the first son of Ishmael, um, Sheba, Kedar, Nebaioth. This is Saudi Arabia. And Midian is linked and placed, according to the scriptures, with these places in Saudi Arabia, not listed side by side with the northern regions of the northern segments of southern Jordan today or the northern sections of Edom. Okay, so in conclusion, I know this has gone really, really long, but in conclusion, and again, this was me trying to trim down. I mean, I could have really kind of got into a, lo a lot more quotes and, and all sorts of different things. In conclusion, Heiser makes several really substantial big blunders. Um, again, I, I, I really want to reiterate the fact that I love his work on the Divine Counselor, Council. He's done some great work on the Near Eastern context of, of the Bible. I mean, just there's a lot of really good stuff. I appreciate that. However, from the perspective of, of scholarship, his arguments against Jabal Allahs are sloppy. I mean, this, they were really sloppy. And then I didn't even get into a lot of it. He kind of got into some other stuff at the end. And he really makes a lot of statements that are actually just not true, like just stated out of ignorance. Um, as I said earlier, in all likelihood, it's because Mike just wants to distance himself from this because he thinks it's goofy. But like I said, guys, this is much more important than somebody's, somebody's reputation or their image. It's much more important. This is not for me just some pet theory. I really believe the Lord is going to use this in a powerful way. So when all is said and done, again, I've worked through all of the critical stuff. I've worked through it all. I worked through it for a year. Uh, I mean, you know, painstakingly through point after point after point. Jebel Allah's is absolutely by far the single best candidate for the real Mount Sinai. And it's an incredibly convincing, uh, convincing case. And any of the arguments that Mike set forth so far, I know he's going to come out with more. Um, but so far, he, he really shot himself in the foot um, and really kind of blew it. So... I hope that just sort of working through this, I hope I was able to present the information in a way that was uh, understandable, that it was clear. I hope I didn't go too, too long. But um, again, this, this is an issue that's important to me. I think it really does matter. I think the Lord is going to use this. And so please pray uh, going forward that um, you know, everything would come together, that we could really document and highlight this and bring this out and that it would open up and that the world could go in and see it and experience the joy and, the, as I said, the, the soul-stirring, faith-stirring uh, experience to actually see this place. So that's all the time that we have for this week. Again, guys, thank you so much for bearing with us. I know this is probably the longest program that I've done yet. But, um, but uh, I did. Thanks so much for seeing your help. So look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The